Dr. Marion Christopher Pugh uh, is our next guest. And uh, I think he's got a lot of great useful information. Uh, Rashida, can you cue up uh, Dr. Pugh for me, please? Hey, there he goes. What's going on, What's man? Up, I'm chilling, man. How are y'all? Better now, man. Good, good to see me? you. Good to see y'all too, man. Great job today. Thank you, thank you. Um, you ready to uh, take us to our, our next topic? Oh, I guess you are ready, okay. Take it away. Sure, 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 sure. sure. Well, first of all, thank y'all so much for um, your, just your contribution to everyone's mental health today. I really appreciate the uh, invitation and look forward to working with y'all in the future. Uh, today, um, just a little bit about myself, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Marion Christopher Pugh. I'm a, um, I'm a product of the Cab County School System. I went to Georgia Southern University um, and graduated with all three of my degrees from Georgia Southern. And I'm currently uh, teaching in the College of Education right now when I teach diversity. And I also am an educational consultant. So today, I wanted to pretty much give you all a glimpse into what I coined or what I try to reference as mental wealth, all right? Um, and one thing I want everyone to kind of think about is the term or the phrase that you've heard your entire life. Um, if you were like me, I've heard this phrase, um, health is wealth. I kept hearing it over and over again, over and over again. Uh, and uh, a lot of people who say it kind of implied the meaning, but I wanted to kind of give uh, people a, a journey into investigating what that meaning is. What is mental health versus mental wealth, all right? Uh, first, uh, what we want to do is just to make sure that we kind of understand what mental health is. Uh, one thing that I find out about mental health is extremely personal. Uh, what's mentally healthy for one person may be mentally catastrophic for the next. So you wanna make sure that you have a working personal definition of what mental health and mental wealth really is. You don't wanna make sure, you, want, you wanna make sure that you're not carrying someone else's interpretation or their influences with you and pretending they are your own. So you wanna make sure that your definition is um, objective and subjective. You wanna know what everyone kind of uh, deems as mental health, but you also want to create your own definition that's functional for mm -hmm. your uh, for your own life. Uh, next up, be honest with what you know about yourself and how you think. What a lot of people may not understand is that uh, we live in a world where political correctness is more abundant than actual correctness. So we are really um, in a state where we are concentrating on making sure we don't make other people upset at the uh, detriment of making sure we are upset internally. So we wanna make sure everyone else is feeling all right, um, as opposed to us making sure that we're balanced human beings. So we wanna make sure that we're honest with ourselves. We're not trying to pretend that we're happy, pretending that we're sad. We wanna make sure that we're not pretending that we're actually attending our own life. We wanna make sure that poverty versus abundance, you wanna make sure that you understand, especially if we're thinking about health is wealth. You want to make sure that you understand what poverty and abundance is, and you want to make sure that your attention span, uh, whatever your thoughts are uh, leaning towards, you want to make sure that you understand what directions your thoughts are going into, regardless of where they are. We're human beings. We're going to have all types of thoughts, but you want to make sure that your thoughts are more leaning towards abundance or the uh, I would say the possibility of abundance instead of just living in a place of poverty, because we're all going to experience ups and downs in our lives, but we can influence how we think to our best ability. Uh, we want to question this. This is a really good question. Does uh, how you invest time and energy affect how you think? Now, this is the um, this is a very important thought process that a lot of people that I talk to have the mindset that time and energy is the best currency because how you spend your time and energy actually has an effect on the paper money or the currency that we use to buy food pay rent all these other different things right so what we got to do is make sure that we understand how we invest time and energy and i'm gonna be honest with you what really constitutes wealth is everything that is priceless i'm gonna say that again the things that money can't buy needs our, uh, the most of our mental investments. So we're going to talk about that as well. Uh, we need to investigate the difference between peace and serenity. When I was growing up, I thought peace and serenity was the same thing, and they have subtle differences. 
uh, but it depends on how you approach them. They could make or break your whole outlook on life. And we're really going to have an honest conversation about the difference between peace and serenity. One is external, one is internal. And we'll go uh, a little bit more in depth about that. And just a question, if health is wealth, we must understand the similarities in order for us to be mentally wealthy and mentally healthy. Next slide, please. All righty, um, like I said before, at the very beginning, I asked everyone to have a personal um, definition of mental health. And I just, this is just a contribution. It's not a definition that everyone has to abide by. That's, these are my thoughts. And you can feel free to either agree with these thoughts or investigate these thoughts and challenge them. I said mental health includes, uh, it doesn't mandate, but it includes the ability to choose, control, and filter information that influences your thought, speech, and action. What do I mean by that? Um, some of the information that we're subjected to, we don't have a uh, choice over what we're kind of exposed to. However, the way we receive the information, we can influence that. So say for instance, if we, um, like for instance, uh, we have the choice over which books we read. We have the choice over which TV shows we spend our most of our time to. We, um, we have the choice over the company that we actually keep, our circles in life, uh, the people we choose to uh, be around. Now, one of the things that we don't have control over are the people that are in our circle or comprise our, um, I would say, our overall circles, like your family, the people that you're in a classroom with when you're actually in um, K through 12. You don't choose your classmates. Hell, when you're a child, you don't even choose your school. It's a lot of things that you don't choose. However, the way you respond to the things that you don't choose can affect your mental health. And last but not least, uh, that filter. Some of the things that we are exposed to, they demand critical, uh, a critical thought process. What do I mean by that? You can't help what people tell you, but you can always help what you believe. Now, one thing about mental health is that accountability increases your ability to be balanced and more healthy. Now, one thing that I've noticed in a, a lot of years that I've just not only, you know, received help myself, but also in helping other people mm -hmm. is that sometimes when you feel like you don't have a choice, you end up not choosing anything. And if you don't choose anything, you could convince yourself that you don't have a choice because you don't even know you can choose in the first place. So that self-accountability is a really, really, mm -hmm. uh, I would say, mm -hmm. successful way to gain mental freedom and mental health and wealth. All right, thank you. Uh, next slide, please. All righty, how important is accountability? What I want everyone to kind of think about is when I say accountability, I want you to think of your bank account. All right, so when we start thinking about accounting or our bank account, it means that we need to know exactly where our money is going and why is it going there? Is it going to a place that we really need it to go? Is it an investment? Or is it a liability? Is it an asset? Or is it, or is it something that's going to put me in more debt? And one thing that I found out the similarity between how we think and how we spend money is that both of them can be a debt mindset, or you can have something that can be in abundance, something that you can actually grow from, something that you can invest in, something that can actually feed you for generations to come. Uh, how important is accountability? It increases the ability to have influence over your destiny and fate, like I said before. Um, one thing that I find out is that being a victim may be a circumstance, but you want to make sure that you never, ever uh, make it an permanent identity. I'm going to kind of repeat that. Being a victim is a circumstance, or if someone is assaulting you, then you can be a victim at that moment. But you want to be very, very careful of identifying until you and that's the reason why a lot of people have a lot of self-fulfilling prophecies or self-fulfilling, I would say, um, journeys because they have taken on the identity of something that was extremely traumatic that lasted for either a day or a week or how, how, however long it lasted. But they take that moment and turn it into an identity and then they try to have overall influence over their destiny and fate. And we want to make sure that we're very, very uh, clear about that. Um, let's see here lowers the external expectations and increases mental empowerment, which is wealth. What do I mean by that? External expectations guarantee disappointments. That's on a, a couple of bullet points down. Now, what do I mean by that? 
anytime when we um, allow other people to have full autonomy about how we live, how we think of ourselves, we guarantee disappointments because we don't have a lot of influence over what other people do and how other people feel about us specifically. So we want to be very, 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 very careful about that by having external expectations. And when it comes down to external expectations, we want to try to flip those into internal expectations. That means you're going to increase your accountability, your mental wealth, your mental uh, prowess, your mental abilities, meaning that you're going to hold yourself to a higher standard instead of holding strangers to a higher standard that may or may not be interested in holding those standards in the first place. It's almost like people are easier to fail tests when they don't even know they're taking the test in the first place. And when you have a lot of people going out and testing people to see if they care about them, when in actuality, it's gonna benefit you more to learn how to take care of yourself and show other people how you treat yourself than expecting them to know how to treat you when you don't know how to treat yourself. So you have to show the world how to treat you by investing in yourself mentally, spiritually, financially, all, all of the above. Uh, next bullet, it increases mental investments uh, you can connect with instead of control. So this is one of the things that I, I that has helped me personally and helped a lot of my clients. Um, a lot of my clients find it beneficial to connect with uh, entities in their life, family, situations, uh, different uh, uh, scenarios instead of being in control. And that's going to be the difference between peace and serenity. We're going to visit a little bit later. Now, when it comes down to mental investments, you want to have a connection with things. And I, I want to give you all a quote that I got from uh, Big Rube. He's a uh, part of the Dungeon family. And he said this quote that I'll never forget. He said, your relationships with other people will always test your belief in yourself. I'm going to repeat that. Your relationships with other people will always test your belief in yourself. Now, what does that mean? That means the people that you have in your circle and even your enemies, everybody is going to test your belief in yourself. Some people are going to be malicious, and some of them are going to have a really good heart when they actually do it. So you have to be very careful about how you receive the tests that people give you. Some, some of the tests that some of your loved ones are going to give you, yeah, they may hurt, but you want to make sure that you understand the intent behind every test that all of your relationships give. Some of the people in your family, yes, they may have hurt you, but what was their intent? Some of the people outside of your family, they may seem real friendly until you find out their intent, and you want to be very, very careful about that. External expectations are connected to disappointments. And I'm going to be honest with you. How many of us are close with people or very, um, or even ourselves have um, taken on this, I don't need anyone attitude. Um, the world is against me. Everybody's bad people. Because of some of the disappointments that people have given you, based off the expectations that you didn't even tell them about. And I'm gonna give you something to think about. Anytime when you give expectations without letting the person know, you're setting them up for failure. I'm gonna say that again. Anytime when you're uh, putting expectations on someone without letting them know, you're setting them up to fail. And so that's how that self-fulfilling prophecy, that influence over your destiny and fate, that's how it can come. It can really turn into a really huge whirlwind if you're not careful. So now, what really needs to be questioned not only their intent, but what is your intent when you question and test people without them knowing. Last but not least, consistent disappointments can lead to confusion, malicious conflict, depression, and anxiety. And I'm gonna be honest with you: when a lot of people don't have a lot of specific mental income. That's when a lot of people experience those feelings of depression, anxiety. They, they have a lack of control and all of a sudden things get very, very nervous and they may lash out at other people. And when sometimes when people would lash out at other people, most hurt people hurt people who are closest to them. And that's anytime, anytime that you want to increase your mental health and your mental wealth, you have to be cognizant of how you relate to people when you're actually in pain. All right. Uh, how does accountability relate to mental wealth? I want everyone to think about their mental health like a bank account. Now, attention is currency. Now, what do I mean? Most of us, when we were growing up in, in, in school and, or just in your family, people always told you to pay attention. And if you have to pay attention, that means your attention is currency. That means your attention is real money. 
So have you ever noticed that whatever you pay attention to, your money literally follows? Think about the reason why so many people spend so many so much money on commercials, advertising, because they know if they can catch your attention, that is a huge possibility your money is going to follow your attention. So if you really want to take control of your money, your attention must have that discipline before your money follows. Your external expectations are mental liabilities and self-accountability are internal investments. They're mental assets. And what do I mean by that? Anytime when you're expecting people to do certain things for you and you put give them all of that power, all of that control, those are expenses. You're very liable for what they do. I'm gonna be honest with you. I understand how scary it can be for other people to be in control of what you do. Now, I'm not telling people that they shouldn't seek help when they need it. I'm not telling people they shouldn't accept help when it's offered. I'm saying when you're actually expecting help without even trying to do something on your own, that is a setup for a mental liability. That way you only can be a person disappointed in how everybody treated you instead of you being uh, assisted in some of the things that you're doing for yourself. Now, self-accountability turns into internal investments and income and mental assets. And what do I mean by that? Your self-accountability means, just like I said before, what are you paying attention to? If you're actually, it's just like our parents and you know our mentors tell us, if you handle your business, you want to be wondering what other people are doing. And that's the key. What are we doing? Are you actually investing your time, your space, your energy to the things that's actually going to feed you mentally and your family and your closest friends mentally? What are you doing? Are you thinking in an asset uh, time, in a mind frame? Or are you thinking in a deficit? Are you always consumed about what, about what someone else is doing? Let's look at social media. You have, I'm gonna give you an example. Have you ever been on social media and next thing you know that the time of the day has just flown by? You've been on social media looking at what everybody else is doing that you don't even take care of your own business. That's what I'm talking about. That is a mental liability. Anytime where we're paying attention to something that doesn't pay us in return, we're dealing in mental liabilities. We have to be very, very careful about that. Uh, this next quote is extremely important. Leverage without loyalty is a liability. How can we expect others to be more loyal to us than we are to ourselves? Now, what do I mean by that? Leverage without loyalty is a liability. Anytime when you give other people power over you and they don't have an investment in your life, that is a liability and you can be a liability to yourself. Why would you expect strangers to respect you more than you respect yourself? I said it a little earlier, but that is the liability mindset. So sometimes when we start talking about loyalty, we have to be loyal to self. And that doesn't mean that we mistreat anyone else, but being loyal to yourself, that self-discipline and that self mindset, it will have self-awareness instead of selfishness. Selfishness is when you are so consumed with yourself that you don't mind mistreating other people. Self-awareness is when you're so conscious of what you're doing that you not only benefit, but so many people around you are going to benefit, then your friendships are going to bloom. They're going to blossom. And not only that, when your friendships blossom, your mental health and your mental wealth increase as well. Internal investments are like real money. They are more concrete. The more you spend, the more you receive. Now, think about this, all of the people who are entrepreneurs, uh, all the people who are readers, writers, all of these different things that you all want to do. The more time you've invested is the more res uh, response that you've gotten in your life. Everyone has experienced that. It may not work out every time, but at least a couple of times in your life, you know when you've invested time in yourself, when you study longer, when you read longer, when you listen more when you actually pay attention to some things that's gonna feed you, they have a tendency to feed you in abundance. Many of us are using external expectations like credit cards when we don't have the accountability, the knowledge of self to back them up. All right, next slide, please. All right, serenity and peace. And I'm gonna be honest with you, I went to my counselor this week and I just added this a couple of days ago and it blew my mind because I was one of those people that use serenity and peace interchangeably. I used to swap them out and think they were the exact same thing. But when I found out that there's a major difference, and it's not a, a, a negative dis difference, but it is a difference. And anytime when you assume anything 
you're playing with fire. So I want to make sure that we understand exactly what the difference or the difference how it was explained to me. Now, you may have a whole different approach to this and feel free to have your own approach. I suggest you have your own approach, but I'm going to share with you what was exposed to me this week. How is serenity and peace different? The next point, peace is something that you can control and maintain, like keep, like being a keeper of the peace. And the funny thing is, peace is something that has to be maintained and kept. That means you're still expending energy in order to maintain that peace. I'm going to give you an example. Um, you ever had a time where you can actually be at peace? You're not, uh, things can be peaceful. It can be very, very quiet, but internally you're still in turmoil. Your mind is racing, your, uh, your energy is low, but around you it looks peaceful because peace is external. It's what everybody else can see. You look so peaceful, you look so happy. A lot of people put on a facade and put on this peaceful, uh, I would say this um, it, the external peace looking, uh, I want facade is a really bad word, but external example, I would say for lack of a better word, that it helps people put on this perception of that person and it helps them leave them alone. So it works for them, but that doesn't mean they have serenity. Now, what is serenity? Serenity is experienced when energy is conserved, conserved by letting go the need for control. I'm gonna say that again. Serenity is experienced when energy is conserved when letting go by letting go the need for control. Now, what does that mean? Now, just like I said, peace, I'm gonna be honest with you. Uh, it's amazing. You ever notice how people have a gun on the hip and say, I got my peace on me? Now, I'm going to be honest with you. Yeah, you may have a gun on your hip and a lot of people may not mess with you, but you still have a need to put that gun on you. You still have a need to be in control of something. You still have that need to enforce something. And peace, just like war, uh, is, to, is on the other side of the same coin. Peace has something to do with war because without one, the other one is present. All right. Now, serenity. Like I said before, when my counselor told me this week that you had a lot of peace, you, had, you know how to uh, uh, express peace and maintain peace and create peace for others. But what type of serenity are you experiencing? And I couldn't even answer the question. And he looked at me directly and said, I don't think you've ever experienced serenity, Chris. And it kind of blew my mind because I'm a peaceful person, but I've never been serene. So what does that mean? Some of the things that I can control, I control them very, very well. I know how to interact with people. I know how to make sure I don't take things out on people. But the mindset and some of the thoughts that I have internally when nobody else can have access to, they're extremely, I would say, dangerous from time to time. And I'm not saying to the point where they're so detrimental like life or death. I'm saying like, I'm going to give you an example. Uh, the narrative that men, especially men of our culture, um, this narrative of men are lazy, men are violent, men are this, men are that. And I grew up with those different narratives. So what happens, I internalize the narratives without questioning them as a young person. And what I try to make sure I do is be, um, not be a statistic by supporting the narrative. The danger in that, well, I'll put it like this, the benefit of doing that is to make sure that everyone around you is peaceful. They're proud of you. They're giving you high fives. They're congratulating you. The flip side to that is every time I'm just resting, I'm fighting with the idea that I'm being lazy when in actuality, I'm a human being that needs rest. I had no serenity, but I had all the peace in the world. We need to have a balance between acceptance and courage. And, and I see someone in the chat that said, you know, the serenity prayer, and you don't have to be religious to understand what's going on in certain religious texts, but I'm going to be honest with you. It says that, you know, grant me the serenity to change, you know, um, and, and that, that right there is, is something that a lot of people don't understand. Courage to change the things that I can, and then wisdom to know the difference. That wisdom part at the very end is to understand that balance. I believe when you have, when you're experiencing wisdom and you possess wisdom, that's when you have a peaceful mental balance. All right. Uh, peace is more physical and serenity is more mental. All right. So that's what just pretty much what mental wealth is. You have to understand that balance and just like serenity and peace, when you have a balance between that, you will balance your mental 
bank account at that time. So I'm open for questions. Awesome, man. Uh, that was such a, a, a great presentation so far, man. Really appreciate it. I have a question for you, if you don't mind oh. answering mine. Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, you had mentioned uh, earlier in your presentation about sometimes giving um, others complete autonomous um, kind of, not control, but just like auton autonomy, complete autonomy when it comes to, um, you know, your, my own self worth or value. Um, do you have any thoughts on how to, um, I guess, combat that when it's, you know, not healthy? Right. So narrative and authority is some totally that that has to be discussed on a mature level and an intense level so when i say authority you have to question who's the author of that narrative that you're trying to live out you know what i mean and so now put like this you have a lot of people who are outside of you who will always put their expectations on you if you don't understand where those expectations come from half the time they don't even understand where those expectations come from and they just know how to pass them along because sometimes when you don't know how to meet expectations, you pass them along to somebody you think can. Mm. And so if you don't even understand where that stuff is coming from, because I'm going to be honest with you, a lot of people are passing along expectations uh, maliciously. Mm. <laughs> They're passing them down maliciously. If they didn't think they could do something, they will make you have to do it. I'm going to give you an example. I mean, a lot of parents who didn't do well in school and they go overboard in their children and burning them out. And they're saying detrimental things to their children. And then they'll say, well, it worked for me. And I'm like, ma'am, sir, it didn't. Because <laughs> if it worked for you, you wouldn't have a need to, <laughs> I said, you wouldn't have a need to really abuse your child. And that's what a lot of people may not understand. The, the things that, I would put it like this, just because you survived the tragedy doesn't mean the tragedy worked. Mm. That means you survived the tragedy. And that's what a lot of people don't understand. We're passing down traumatic events thinking that we're doing someone a favor because it happened to me. No, it happened to you because it was wrong and it shouldn't happen to you. Now you passing down certain things <laughs> and expecting your child to have the same result. Newsflash, your child has more distractions than you did. <laughs> that's real. They have more temptations than you did. So when you got, you got a lot of people who have in these 70s, 80s, and 90s expectations in 2020 is literally a mental disservice to the child that has to deal with all of it. Wow. No, you're, right. you're right. We, we have another question from one of the attendees. Are there daily practices or habits you can give to help redirect your mental wellness when you are, to use an analogy, make a lot of withdrawals, paying attention to others, so that you are in making deposits, paying mm. attention to yourself. Mm. Okay. Got you. Now, I'm going to go back to that quote that I got from Big Rule. Your relationships with other people will test your belief in yourself. Every relationship is a test, regardless if it's full of love or full of malice. They are both testing you. Some people are trying to keep friends that really aren't their friends. They're just enemies with the friend title. And that's really going backwards on your mental wealth and your mental health. Because guess what happens? Most of us are investing time and energy into things that have never fed us in the first place, mm -hmm. mentally and physically. Think about how much trash we eat, how much trash we consume that really don't feed us. That's the reason why we still have a need to consume most of it, because we're still not being fed. So the things that we're saying in our minds, and back to that, the, the actual statement, what can you do? I would say as soon as you, well, one thing that has helped me out, every day you get up in the morning, you say I, and then fill in your entire name and say, love you. Mm. I, then I love you, and then, I'm sorry, say I love you, and then say your entire name. Keep saying that until you have a genuine smile that comes onto your face. Because some people were like, well, what if I don't love myself that day? I said, that's fine. You may be in a position where you're not feeling yourself, right? But I'm just asking you, you're talking about an exercise. Sometimes you don't feel like exercising, but guess what you got to do to stay in shape? You still got to take your, <laughs> excuse me. You still got to take yourself to that place to get, excuse me, you, you already know how this is. All right, <laughs> you still got to go to that place. And do, you, you still got to go and do that work regardless of how you feel. And I'm going to tell you this, mental health, it's not based off your emotions. Mm -hmm. Mental health is not based off how you want, feel like doing. 
you may not feel like loving yourself, but you have to do it to stay alive. Mm -hmm. Just like your physical health. So if you don't feel like doing it, still get up in the morning, put on a headband and some cleats. I don't care. (laughs) I love you. And fill in your whole name. Keep saying it until it becomes genuine. And then stop lying to yourself and other people. I'm going to be honest with you. Lying is a hell of a drug. Lying is a hell of a drug because a lot of us, we have uh, invested in political correctness that we haven't even been living in or experienced correctness in our entire life. We're so politically aware that we want to be liked instead of self-love. And that's a dangerous game. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. One last question uh, before you leave, Dr. Pugh. How do you practice not taking out negative energy on others? Mm. Oh, man. Okay. I got a uh, saying that hopefully it will help someone. This is what I've been living by since middle school and has worked thus far. All right. I just got a mantra and I try to, I don't say this every day, but I live it every day. All right. <clears throat> Don't dish out things you can't take. Mm. And don't take the things you don't dish out. Mm. I'm going to say it again. Right, here you go. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it again. I do not dish out the things I cannot take. And I refuse to take the things I don't dish out. That's balance. Uh, amen, amen. Thank you so much, Dr. Pugh, the man, the myth, the legend for your time, for these yeah. gems, for dropping all that knowledge. We really appreciate you being here. Um, how can the people reach you? The people want to be able to reach you, Dr. Pugh. Oh, man. Got you. No, thank you so much. Um, you can reach me on Instagram. It's under Manhood Mindset. Uh, I'm on Twitter, Manhood Mindset. I'm on Facebook, just under Christopher Pugh. You can reach me uh, on my website, manhoodmindset.com. Uh, I help anybody with a heartbeat. I'm a consultant for human beings, really. It doesn't matter if it's educational, professional, personal, family, you know, relationships, anything that's dealing with the communication between human beings, I can definitely help you out. Um, just a little bit of background about who you're talking to. I've been a mediator since I was in fifth grade. And I was, I, I, I'm just being honest with you. I was one of those people that know how to figure out the miscommunication and the disconnects between people. And I know how to expose the problem and expose what's going on in people's lives so they can handle it themselves. So you're dealing with somebody who's been working at this since I was a kid. That's great, man. Uh, my final thought, I, I just want to commend you on this beautiful bow tie, bro. Um, so th- nah. <laughs> I wasn't sure what my day was going to be. got it from Amazon. Yes. Thank you so no, much. No, no, I, no. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's pre-tied, man. It's a clip on, man. I ain't front. I didn't tie this. <laughs> yeah, I knew that. So you take care, bro. Yeah. Yeah, the people need to know that. <laughs> Just playing. Y'all take care. Peace. Thank you. Y'all give it up for Dr. Pugh. Rashida, are you still there? Are you sleeping? Rashida, how are we back? All right. Rashida. <laughs> Rashida. Oh, hey. Okay. Hey. We're back. We're back. All right, good people. Thank you. Take care. I got a lot from that, especially, especially that loyalty piece. Come Let me tell on, you, come like, on. being loyal to the wrong people, that'd be messed up. Loyalty, loyalty, loyalty. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that was awesome. Um...